All of this would have been welcome in the early 2000s, but the years of disappointing follow-ups and the overall progression of industry standards leads to Star Fox Zero having the impact of an HD re-release rather than a Star full Fox Zero is the most fun I've had with any Wii U game, game to date. Help. Sometimes no great, sometimes rough, but mostly patchy. It's rough around the edges, but it sports one of the best, most interesting games. It sounds confusing! It is confusing! It's also not optional! This is how you play Star Fox Zero. It's the shooter equivalent of rubbing your thumb and patting your head. It's also keeping a patch back in the air with your blood. But you might as well have done Star Fox Zero. Don't be a good one, Star Fox Zero. Okay, well, now I have to play this. Released in 2016, Star Fox Zero was one of Nintendo's final major releases for the Wii U, and a little bit of an oddity. Due to the lack of hardware sales, Nintendo infamously cut the Wii U's lifespan short, and pushed up the follow-up and fan-favorite system, the Switch, to take its place. In the years since release, most of the Wii U's kind of major catalog has been ported over, but that's not the case for every first party game. Star Fox Zero is seemingly one of those very few games, and at first glance, it's not immediately obvious why. It's bright, it's appealing, and it's the latest entry in a fan favorite series. Oh, right, it's also a soft remake of everyone's favorite, Star Fox 64, which is also a remake of the SNES Star Fox game, so it's a re remake. On paper, sure, it makes sense. If Tokyo Mirage Sessions, for all of the brouhaha around that game, can see the light of day again on Switch, then um, why can't Star Fox Zero? Well, it's a complicated answer. Starting out of the gate, in pre-release demonstrations, it was clear that the game was going to use the Wii U's signature tablet controller and the built-in gyro controls as the primary way of aiming. And uh, this was not great. Other games, like Splatoon, had also used this control scheme, but with the option to completely disable it and use the traditional twin-stick method instead. However, with Star Fox, Nintendo decided to stick with their guns and made it mandatory. You are stuck with it. Then, upon release... <sighs> oh boy. To call the reception mixed would be to put it mildly. Everything from top honors to bottom marks, peppered with all scores in between. Sadly, as we know, I am... Um kind of like a fly to poo when it comes to games with complicated histories, and it's very clear the only way I'm going to get a grasp on this situation is, um, well, to play it. Opening the game greets you with a tutorial. Okay, well, I suppose that feet first is the best way to go ahead into the game, and, uh, well, it just sort of throws you right into it. It's here that you get to test out the motion controls, and, uh, Hmm. Every little movement of the gamepad moves the reticle, and it's got a habit of going wherever it wants. The good news is that you can reset it at will by pressing Y, but like... Why? I'm already using one of my two sticks to move, why can't I just use the other one to aim? Now, there is an option to soft disable the motion controls. I say that because there is no real way to completely disable them, Instead, what you've got is the option to uh, only have motion whenever you press ZR to go into the aiming mode. I did this very quickly because it felt significantly more natural to me. They are still very present though. The tutorial ends with a quick trip around the Great Fox and then... Oh yeah, bring on the fan service. It's a character roll call to the series title theme, which is quickly deflated by Fox monologuing. It feels very, um, I don't know, low effort. Look, I get it. I get what we're doing here. We're trying to reference 64 a lot, but swapping out the narrator and the crawl for the main character here kind of just, you know, it feels like a cop out. For those of you who don't know the basic plot, I'll uh, quickly boil it down some. Bear with me. Andros, a giant space monkey, is hellbent on taking over the lilac system of planets by force. And opposing him is General Pepper, who is a dog, 
and uh, he's going to hire a fox, a rabbit, a falcon and a toad. After doing the same thing five years before with that fox's dad, the same rabbit and a uh, pig who betrays them, leaving Fox Senior to sacrifice himself so the rabbit can live. I'm aware this sounds like furry fanfiction. After the tutorial, the game breaks down into 12 main missions, which, naturally, take on the same kind of gameplay that we've seen before in Star Fox 64. On rails type shooting missions, where the idea is to survive a shooting run from point A to point B, all range mode missions, which typically involve large scale dogfights, and a third, harder to define type of mission that usually involves a new type of vehicle or gimmick, such as the Landmaster or the Gyrocopter. The first, the on rails runs, are probably the best of the bunch since Honestly, accuracy isn't the biggest requirement here. Simply surviving is good enough. And given how the controls are, I'm fine with that. Yes, the motion controls are supposedly muted, but I still have to tilt the gamepad to aim above and below. That's actually a thing I've noticed with some very staunch defenders of this game. They swear blindly that you can disable the motion controls. So I'm just gonna say on the record now, no. No, you cannot disable the motion controls. You can nerf them by having them only come on when you aim, but they're still very much there, and you still very much need to use them. All range mode is not so good, mostly because you have to take out a certain number of targets, which isn't so easy with the aforementioned control issues, but also because, frankly, your comrades are, how do I put this politely, absolutely bloody useless. At the end of every level, you can see how many bogeys they took down and... Damn, I'm literally carrying the mission here. And Slippy is also a war criminal. Those all-range missions typically end with a boss fight and, uh... Eh... This one against a spider type machine isn't too bad, it's just overly long and tedious. Same goes with an earlier one with this sandworm thing. This one with a giant gorilla mecha though. <laughs> okay, so you have to use the gyrocopter, which actually isn't too bad to steer thanks to it being totally stabilized, but you also have to land a little teeny tiny robot on its back to uh, hack it, which is a proverbial pain in the neck. And also playing this is a literal pain in the neck. To take in your surroundings, you need to look at the TV screen, but then to aim, you need to look at the gamepad. So it's up, down, up, down, up, down. I can't tell you how many times I took unnecessary damage from crashing into things because I was switching between screens. Speaking of the gyrocopter, it's a good example of the third kind of mission that relies on gimmicks. Like I said, the gyro isn't too bad to fly, and honestly, it's inoffensive. But the missions in the tank? I would really, really rather not. Speaking of rather not, the final boss. After a mere four hours of playing, I found myself in the final level. No, really. Just like one in three men, I was at the climax surprisingly early. It actually starts out quite strong, with an all-out dogfight against rival team Star Wolf in scenery reminiscent of a certain trench run. And I'll be honest, it was almost magical here for a second. The presentation is great, the soundtrack is amazing, boosting and maneuvering in the R-Wing feels fantastic. It's just too bad that the aiming isn't worth a damn. It's also too bad that this is where the game should have called it quits. After that, there's this, uh weird maze thing. I don't know, man. It's like Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite, but purple and with Ghost Dad leading the way. What they should have just called this scene is restock on resources before the giant monkey man, because <sighs> I'm just going to put it bluntly. Andros is not a test of skill. Andros is a test of patience. And right here is where I can best demonstrate why this control scheme and two screen gimmick just doesn't work. The first thing you'll notice when you get here is that Andros is surrounded by a weird crystal shield. To find an entrance, you have to look at your gamepad and fly through a hidden opening. 
Sometimes they are big, and sometimes you are squeezing in a gap so tight you'd think that the R-Wing would need to coat its wings in KY jelly. For my Brit friends back home, Vaseline. Once you get in, the R-Wing automatically transforms into its walker mode, and here the chaos truly begins. Andros's weak spots are his hands, and my god do they give you the tightest openings that require pin point precision to hit. Oh, and of course, we're using possibly the least accurate control scheme of all damn time. It's a painful, long battle that often ends in abject failure, and it only gets more and more frustrating. Dodging his attacks, while possible, is a timing nightmare, since the R-Wing takes so long to change back, leaving you open to extra damage. And don't get me started on this stupid purple traction beam. It's dumb, it's overly difficult for the sake of padding, and honestly, it's the worst section of the game by a country mile. And trust me, that's saying a lot. I recorded about seven and a half hours of footage for this video, and around half of that was this bloody fight. But I did it, I pushed through, and I beat the damn thing. And what did I get? The ending of Star Fox 64. And wait, what are they saying? Star Fox, we are forever in your debt. There's a place for you in the Cornarian army, if you want it. Sorry, General. We like doing things our own way. Good lord. What really sucks here is that this game, honestly, it has a lot going for it. The graphics are great, bright and appealing. The soundtrack is fitting and bombastic. It's just the control scheme and double screen gimmick that completely and utterly crush it with this forced dependence. Can this be ported to Switch? Honestly, I don't know. I really don't know. More so, I don't really think it's worth the effort. Sometimes, that is better. Oh, right, did I mention that this game was made by Platinum? Granted, I'm far from their biggest fan, but yikes! And also, just throwing this out here at the end of the video, yeah, I I'm aware there are multiple branching paths and optional missions to do, but uh, simply put, uh, I'd really rather not spend any more than I, you know, have to of myself on this game, so uh, it's going to be a no from me, bud. Okay, okay, I think that's all the anthro that I need for now. I'm going to take a deep breath, cleanse my thoughts, going to close my eyes, deep breath, Exhale. When I open my eyes, there's going to be a game that makes it all better. I just want to throw a special thanks here at the end of the video to Devon Voivio, to Grim Luminary, to Satohara, to Luke Sutton, and of course, as always, to Camera Lady. Also, while you're here, subscribe for God's sake, subscribe!